I'm going to be talking about some advances in type 2 diabetes technology. Um, the second speaker, Dr. Anjana Radakuti, will focus on changes in some of the drugs that are available. We tried to split it a little bit so you could focus on one thing at a time because it's a very big topic. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, to start off with, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit about the changing landscape of what we aim for in diabetes overall, whether it's type 1 or type 2. And it used to be, and I'm sure lots of people would remember that it, when you were diagnosed with diabetes, you had to get your blood sugars always as low as possible, no matter what the situation. That was the party line. It's a bit like treating hypertension. They always said lower was better, no matter what the situation. And we now know that it's not as simple as that. Um, and really, it's about tailoring not only the treatment, but the target to the individual patient. So we're not aiming for the lowest possible blood sugar that's achievable at any given time. It's all about thinking about the patient in front of you, what their needs are, what their situation involves, what their family situation might involve, and thinking a little bit outside the box. So we're moving away from strict, always HbA1c less than 7% and adjusting to the individual scenario. So for example, the patient who has significant vision impairment or may have a you know, diagnosis of dementia, we're not going to be aiming for the same targets that we would in someone who's age 20 who's just been diagnosed. So I guess my point is that it's no longer one size fits all. And the other thing that has changed is that we're moving a little bit away from the concept of just using HbA1c, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with as a term of measurement, um, or glycated hemoglobin is its other name, and moving more towards what's called measured time in range. Um, and this is a theme that has predominantly started in type 1 diabetes, but I think will follow through for type 2 diabetes as well. So it's away from just the concept of average glucose and more towards the concept of how much of your time in, during the 24-hour period do you spend within a target range of blood sugars. So not what an individual average is, but overall, do you spend 20% of the time within target, 40%, 60%, 90%? So it allows us to really get a better feel for not only where you sit, but how stable that control is over a 24-hour period. So this is alluding to the point that I made earlier. So we're really tailoring diabetes management to the individual. And I think that that is the challenge that faces GPs, patients, clients, clinicians, everyone, that it shouldn't just be a case of, okay, you've got diabetes, here's your script. It's, you've got diabetes, how can we make this work for you? And what treatments do we have up our sleeve that might suit your situation? Because the great thing is, is that we have lots of options now. And I think that's more and more the case, and it's going to continue to increase in terms of the number of drugs or the number of insulin pens we can use. So it's not about, should you be on this? It's, which is the best one for you? And this is just a slide that I like because it, it reflects the sheer volume of options we have available to us and the explosion in not only drugs, but devices and technologies. And, um, I think this is particularly the case in the last few years, but my, my mum is a, a general practitioner and she likes to say that she doesn't keep up with diabetes stuff because she says it's just overwhelming. So if it's overwhelming for doctors and clinicians, you can imagine how hard it is for family members, etc. because every week there's a new change. You know, every week something's being discontinued or something's being added to the NDSS. So it's a full-time job. And we appreciate that. So we're trying, our role I think is to try and make it a little bit easier for everyone. So challenges of the new technology age in diabetes. I think it's, you know, the challenge of keeping up to date. I think the issue of who gets access to what in terms of government funding is a massive one. And I'm all for us continuing to push for equitable access to these things. Because unfortunately, it's a truism. As our choices increase, probably the cost does as well. Um, and the government obviously wants to get bang for their buck. Um, and we know that diabetes is one of the most costly conditions in Australia and the world in terms of overall healthcare spending. So I think it's about 
sorting out what changes the course of someone's disease and what will give them the best possible fit, but what will also allow the most number of people to have access as well. And it all comes down to time. So not only for the client or the patient, but for your GP, your podiatrist, your, G your specialist, everyone is more time poor these days. I think you know, it's a, both a blessing and a curse that we have for so many choices because it means you have to cram more in into a shorter amount of time. I'm sure you would all have felt that you know, some visits it just feels like you've barely scratched the surface with your doctor and you know, it's time for the next patient to roll in. And we feel that too. You know, we'd, we'd love to have you know, 90 minutes with everyone to really get into things. So time is always at the back of our minds. So what do I think technology can offer? I think it allows diabetes care to be integrated with everyday life, so tracking your physical activity, tracking your diet, um, whether it's a Fitbit or an app or whatever your particular persuasion is. Um, I think technology also allows for better connectivity between the clinician and the patient. Um, sometimes with good results, sometimes not so good, but I think it at least allows a platform, a way for people to keep in better touch with their caregiver or their clinician. I think it allows for greater flexibility in monitoring. So we know we've got increased monitoring options like flash glucose monitoring, which I'll go into later, and continuous glucose monitors, which we just didn't have available to us not that long ago. And technology also allows us different options for treatment delivery. So it's not just a matter of oral tablets or injections. We have some other options now. And lastly, it gives you real-time feedback on what your glucose is doing. So in the case of flash monitoring, you know, it's just a swipe and you can find out not only what your glucose is at that time, but what the trend has been over several hours. So it gives you a real-time snapshot rather than having to wait to go see your doctor. So I think really we're entering and are already in a very exciting time for diabetes management. Um, and I think it's only going to get better. Um, there are new drugs and new devices exploding all the time. So you know, if you sign up to some of the alerts, there are uh, FDA and TGA approvals coming through quite regularly. I think it's also important to make the point of what technology can't or doesn't do, because sometimes there's a temptation of saying, oh, you know, use this device or this meter and, or this pump and it will suit, suit you and all your problems will be solved. And I, I think there are some things that technology is very limited in. I just wanted to have a disclaimer on this first. So I think it certainly doesn't replace or can't ever replace practical one-on-one -on -one diabetes education where you're sat down with someone with a device in front of you and you take them through exactly how to use it. You can definitely find handouts and leaflets and things to help, but I think nothing really replaces actually showing someone an insulin pen or a blood glucose meter and saying this is how it works. Um, instructions on a, in a pamphlet can only go so far. It also doesn't replace the holistic, whole body, whole person care in terms of looking at blood pressure, cholesterol, weight, eye, foot care that you get from a, an actual consultation. You might be able to put enter your results into an app, but it doesn't necessarily spit out and say this is what you know, your number one priority is. It might say this is out of range, this is out of range, but it won't tell you what your next step should be. Um, it doesn't replace engaging with chronic disease management in terms of diet and exercise. And importantly, and along the theme of this year, it doesn't replace family and carer support, although that does offer some options for increasing family engagement with your condition. It certainly doesn't replace having your loved ones on board with you, which is the theme of, for this year. So I've separated technology and type 2 diabetes into the three M's, just for ease of, ease of presentation and memory. So I think it can offer possible tools for motivation, monitoring, in terms of blood sugar monitoring, obviously, and management. Um, and we'll look at motivation first. So if you consider what sort of the general self-care behaviours are that promote healthy living, diabetes prevention, and diabetes management, you can break it into healthy eating, being active, monitoring your blood sugar, taking your medication or your drugs, um, taking action to reduce your risk of uh, complications, so getting a rational exam annually, for example, getting your feet checked, 
um, problem solving, so knowing how to respond to changes in your condition, um, and healthy coping, which I think is very important. It's a you know, way or a mindfulness of appreciating how your diabetes impacts on your own life and those of others. So there are apps for basically all of these things. Um, as I've discovered through searching the App Store, there's over 1,500 diabetes-related apps as of now, and that has been increasing by hundreds and hundreds each year. So last year there were 1,200, this year there's 1,600, next year there'll probably be 3,000. So there's no shortage of choice, but, and in some ways it's a question of wading through all of that to get to what you really want. So the Australian Diabetes Society suggested some top 10 picks in terms of apps, or these are applications that you can have on your smartphone or a smart watch, et cetera, to sort of sync with your life and with your diabetes. They've suggested MyFitnessPal as a good exercise and calorie tracker, um, Food Switch, which is uh, developed by the George Institute based in Australia, which basically allows you to scan foods in the supermarket or the shop um, with the barcode, and it will suggest to you what the food profile looks like in terms of good, bad, ugly, <laughs> um, and a healthier switch that you might consider in the same family of food. Um, Lark is a sort of personalised health and fitness coach that you can have on your phone. Rise and Recharge is um, an app that tells you to get up and move, sort of like the people who have a Fitbit or an activity monitor that vibrates at 30 minute intervals, just to tell you to get up and pace around the room. Because there are good studies to suggest that the more you sit or the longer during your day that you're still, um, it, the poorer your health outcomes are. So this is just a selection, and I will go into some more on some latter pages as, as well. And this is really the tip of the iceberg, but there's just a useful starting point. So in term, if you're looking at phys fitness and physical activity, um, possibly some of the most popular ones are MyFitnessPal um, and Strava. So MyFitnessPal essentially tracks all your workouts, um, it tracks your calories burned, you can enter nutrition, um, you can link it with your iPhone in terms of your step counter, you can um, link it with Bluetooth to certain meters. Strava was initially a cycling app as reflected in the little map down the bottom. And it's, I think Strava is for the more competitively minded person because you can stalk other people that you know and see what they've been doing in terms of physical activity. And I know my husband will go on his Strava app and see which of his mates have been for a run that week and think, all right, I better go out for a run myself. Um, so I think that is one form of motivation is knowing what other people are doing. Um, RunKeeper is similar to MyFitnessPal and you basically track your activity and where you've run around. And this is just a very small selection. There are literally thousands. Um, and you basically have to pick one that you think works for you in terms of format. Um, or is compatible with your phone. So that's physical activity. If you look at diet and nutrition apps and carbohydrate counting, it's a whole other uh, voyage into the unknown. So Calorie King is very popular and you probably hear your diabetes dietitians mention it. Um, there is an American version and an Australian version. Obviously, I recommend the Australian version. It has everything down to Vegemite in it. Um, so it's tailored to include Australian brands, Australian products, and it tells you what the fat content, sugar content, carbohydrate content, sodium, et cetera, of all your foods are. So you just Google it or look it up as an app on your phone, and it will allow you to get much tighter with your carbohydrate counting if that's something you're doing with your type 2 diabetes, or even just to get an idea of what it is in terms of nutritional value. Food Switch, as I said, is a uh, like a traffic like system where they say that's a red, that's a bad, orange is okay, and green is good, and they suggest switches or alternative options for you, and you can take that around the supermarket and scan foods. Um, Easy Diet Diary is another Australian app uh, where you can track your input and your calories and your nutritional value, and FigWe is the picture down the bottom. Um, where you select meals based on portion sizes that you can eyeball on the app. So on the app, there's a sliding panel where you can go from small serve up to big serve, and it will alter the amount of carbohydrate for you. So for those who don't, or who get sick of weighing things, and or you're out at 
restaurant, for example, and you go, I can't weigh that pasta dish, you know, I'll get some really strange looks if I whip out my kitchen scales. Um, you can actually estimate or guesstimate with this app based on how much is on the plate, and it gives you a, a better, more educated guess at how much carbohydrate you're going to have. So that's a really good app. I've picked mainly Australian ones because there are so many, and these are all free. Um, Obviously, there are lots of American or overseas versions as well, uh, but this is just a good place to start. And then we get into the diabetes-specific apps. So if you're looking at health apps in general, there's over 40,000. Um, I'm sure that's underestimating it now. That was last week I looked that up. <laughs> um, if you look at diabetes-specific, yeah, we're talking between 1,500 and 2,000. Some of the more common ones you'll come across are my sugar. Um, which is or a diabetes tracker, another one called Gluco, which allows you to download some of your meter information and share with your doctor. Um, diabetes Australia app is really good. It um, has recipes for diabetes, um, information on type 1 versus type 2, diagnosis, prevention, management. Um, Glucose Buddy is another glucose tracker. And most of these have an option to integrate with your meter or your results. Um, I've put on here, this is the one exception to my rule of picking out Australian things. I have put on Blue Star Diabetes just as a point of interest because I think it's something we might see in the future. It's actually an app that you get via prescription in the US. So your doctor has to prescribe this app for you. It's a web-based platform and phone app that will actually give you treatment coaching and learn about your diabetes and your targets and your readings and will give you suggested insulin doses based on what your sugars are doing. So obviously it's not, rule, it's not uh, given to everyone because it requires someone to plug in your values and a doctor to be responsible for it, but it's pretty amazing. I encourage you all to have a Google of it. Um, it's really interesting what they do with it. And then we have all the company-specific apps. So these are apps that are designed to link with your blood glucose meters or to help with your glucose monitoring. So My Life is um, a general app which can be used for diet and activity tracking, but it also goes with a pump. The Freestyle Libra link would be familiar to some of you. You can upload your Libra data and look at trends and changes in glucose. The AccuCheck Connect app, the Dexcom, and the list goes on and on and on. So you can see it is a deep, dark hole of many, many options. So I think apps is an exploding area, particularly for type 2 diabetes, because it allows you to track diet and activity as well. Um, and I think the main thing is that the quality is variable. You want to be sure you're getting one that's backed by a verifiable, reliable organisation, preferably an Australian one, if possible. So if you can see that it's been developed by, you know, the Diabetes Institute of X or the Baker Institute or the George Institute or one of the universities in Australia, I think you can be on a safe bet that it's a good app and it would have some backing in science and some very good supervision and oversight. What you don't want to do and what I would caution you against is just downloading any app without knowing who's made it because you want to know that what's been put in that app is not only accurate but safe. That would be my one sort of caution because there's just so much out there. Okay, so that was motivation. We're going to monitoring now. Um, so we've got smart meters, flash glucose monitoring and continuous glucose monitoring. So smart meters, for better or for worse, are slowly, it seems, being phased out, unfortunately. Um, I'm a big fan of these. I sort of see them as a bit of a halfway point between a normal meter and a pump. And I think for some patients with type 2 di diabetes, a really good option if you're wanting to carbohydrate count and get those uh, mealtime insulin doses really accurate. So essentially what they allow you to do is to program the pump, the meter, sorry, with a ratio for how much insulin you get per gram of carbohydrate and how much insulin you need to correct your blood sugar to a target. And if you then take your blood sugar and you tell your meter how much carbohydrate you're eating, it will tell you how many units of insulin you should take to achieve your target blood sugar. And it not only takes into account what you're eating, but what your sugar is and what you want your sugar to be. So, for example, if your target sugar is 7 and your blood sugar is 12 and you're eating a 
piece of pizza, it will tell you how much insulin to take for that slice of pizza and how much insulin to take to get your blood sugar back down to seven. So it's got a couple of built-in factors, which is really useful. So there are two of them, the Freestyle Insulinx and the Accutec Aviva Expert, which has just been discontinued this week. This is what I mean when things change very quickly. Um, and the, the Insulinx is harder to get hold of, um, and largely because they're, they're promoting the flash glucose monitoring a lot more, but they are still out there. Um, and I have always liked getting patients on these. I think they work really well. So for those of you who have them, great. And if you're wanting a replacement, I would urge you to act quickly um, because they may not be around for that much longer. But they're a really good device. So this is something that is newer and I think is what we're moving towards more and more in terms of away from the smart meters and towards this. So this is what's called flash glucose monitoring. Flash because it's fast and it's instantaneous. It doesn't involve a finger prick. Uh, you implant a little, as you can see, the little circular device on your arm and you wear it for 14 days and you can basically swipe with your phone or your Libra reader and it will give you an instant interstitial glucose reading. So it's different to the glucose in your blood by about 10 minutes, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, but it will also give you not only an instant glucose, but also a trend. It will give you an arrow. Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it stable? And that's really useful because you can imagine if you're about to exercise or you're about to have a meal and you're about to exercise and you know your blood sugar's already dropping, if you get a down arrow, then that might, might tell you, hmm, I should eat something before I go out and do that exercise. Or, hmm, that dose of insulin I was about to give myself, you know, pre-exercise or pre-meal, maybe I'll take less. So not only does it give you an instant snapshot, it gives you a trend, which I think is really important. Um, so this is proven very popular. Unfortunately, it's not subsidised by the government as yet, but there are ongoing efforts to make that so. And I see Cameron in the back, and he'll probably be able to tell you more about that. So he's the Abbott rep. Um, and I know that Diabetes Australia and various gov um, governing bodies for diabetes are constantly petitioning the government to have this funded. So watch this space. Um, this is just a bit more detail on the device itself. So there's an app, the sensor, um, which you wear for 14 days, and an applicator. Um, the good thing about it is it's essentially water resistant. You can wear it in the shower, swimming, etc., And it saves you having to prick your finger a million times a day. Um, and you can swipe it as many times as you like. It doesn't wear out in that 14 day period. And in fact, I've had patients who go too much in that direction and just constantly swiping the device. <laughs> it becomes almost like a nervous habit. Um, but I think it's a really good option and um, even for children it's approved as well. So yeah, I think it's very exciting. Um, that's a little bit more detail on the Libre. So this is just to uh, explain to you the difference between interstitial glucose and blood glucose. So um, your, your typical blood glucose meter that you prick your finger and then put the drop of blood on the end of the meter to take a reading takes the blood sugar in your blood. The, these devices, including the Libra and the continuous glucose monitors that you wear in your tummy, they measure the glucose in the surrounding tissue around your blood. So it has a lag time of about 10 minutes because the glucose has to diffuse or move out of the blood into those tissues. So whatever you get on this reading is probably what your blood glucose was 10 minutes ago. So you do have to keep that in mind. Um, but it's still very, very helpful. So that's what the continuous glucose monitor does. You can see it's got a little lead that sits in the interstitial fluid rather than in the blood. So I've very quickly put up some CGM uh, readouts and some information on continuous glucose monitors. Bearing in mind we don't use these as much in type 2 diabetes, but we do use them in a clinic setting. So I'm sure there will be some of you who've had uh, your diabetes appointment and your endocrinologist or specialist has sent you off for a continuous glucose monitor. Anyone? Yeah, I've got one. <laughs> I, I use them for my type 2 patients. I think they're very useful to get patterns. Um, as you can see, you, you basically wear a sensor on your tummy for a week is the average. Um, and that sensor takes your interstitial glucose every five minutes for that whole week. And you can see on the printout that it gives us a 24-hour trace day by day of what your sugar's doing. 
And we can compare that to the sugars you're taking with your finger prick. You do still have to do them so we can calibrate the machine. But the best thing about it is we can see what your blood sugar does after a meal, overnight, windows of time when you might not necessarily have done a finger prick. It gives us a glimpse into what's happening at those times. Or for example, you know, say your HbA1c is you know, 10%, but your blood sugars that you're taking during the day are six or seven. And we're scratching our head and we can't figure out what, why there's that difference. This is a really good way of looking at those pockets of time that a blood sugar finger prick might not be showing up. So in, for in that example, it might be that the patient is having really high blood sugars overnight and not realising it. And then we can change the insulin management to target that a bit better. So this is not something we use all the time in type 2 diabetes, but it's really good as an investigative tool if there's something that's making us, scr us scratch our heads. The other time we sometimes use it is um, if you've got a heavy vehicle licence or a commercial licence and if you've had a lot of hypoglycemia and we want to prove that those lows have gone, we can do a trace for a week and show that there's no more lows and so that you're safe to drive, get that renewed. So there's lots of options in terms of personal CGMs, but we don't see them a huge amount in type 2 diabetes. But we do use these professional systems where you wear them for a week. And with the professional ones, you don't actually get to see your sugar at the time. It's not until we download the device onto the computer that you see the readout. So it's sort of nice. You can be blissfully unaware of what's going on with the device while you're wearing it. And then at the end, you get a bit of a report. And you, the idea is that you take that to your doctor when they download it and you go through it and you say, OK, well, it dipped quite low here. What was happening there? Were you exercising? Had you eaten less? And you sort of go through it day by day and piece together why those patterns are happening. And it's a really good way of getting more information. And I think it, it all comes back again to that central message that I really want to get across about tailoring your diabetes to suit your life and not the other way around. So, you know, if you're wanting to go for that swim or that longer walk or have that dinner out with family, how we can look at those trends and patterns and get your diabetes management to suit that. Because you should be able to live as you want and your diabetes should be fitting around what you want, not the other way around, that's what I think. So in terms of looking down the crystal ball and what might be available down the pipeline, there are some implantable and smaller sensors that may be available eventually. So this is a 14-day sensor that's really, really sort of tiny, about that big, that sits on your tummy. Um, this one is one that can actually be implanted in your arm for 90 days. It's already in use in Europe and it's approved in the US and is in use um, as of this year. It's not in Australia yet. But you basically get it implanted the way you might, you know, a small little piece of... Um, so women who get an implant on their arm to stop their periods, it's a bit similar. Um, and after three months, you can have it taken out and it downloads the data. It's really quite groovy. Um, so I won't... I'm conscious of the time, so I won't spend a huge amount of it on this, but this is basically the differences between SM and BIT due to self-monitoring blood glucose. So that's blood, whereas... And CGM and flash are interstitial and whether you need to do finger pricks, et cetera. But I don't think we need to labour over that. OK, so we've done motivation and monitoring. So finishing up with the third M, which is management, um, we've got smart insulin pens. There are some pumps that are available for type 2 diabetes, which I'll show you. And there's also some new glucagon formulations, which I think are particularly exciting, which um, will be an improvement over our current versions, which I wanted to highlight tonight. So does anyone use a smart pen or a pen that Bluetooths? No, not yet. You do? So these have only become available more recently in Australia. They've been um, in the US and Europe for some time. Um, and the idea is that these pens, not only do you dial up and deliver your insulin, but it actually has a Bluetooth capability with your phone or your meter, and it keeps track of your doses. And it, you'll be able to look back and see 800, your last 800 or 900 doses when you took it. So that moment of horror when you think, oh, gosh, did I take my Lantus this morning? Or, oh, did I already take my Nova Rapid or not? And then you end up doubling up, which I'm sure has happened to everyone. You can actually answer that question and ask your uh, pen, actually, yes, I did take it at 9 a.m. I don't need to take another dose. So it tracks your doses, it can track um, blood sugar, and some of them are actually programmed with the carbohydrate ratio and sensitivity factors as well. They get quite fancy. Um, 
I know that the Smart Pen Plus is certainly available in Australia, although if you go onto their website, they're currently all out of stock <laughs> in all three colours of the pen. Um, but Nova Pen Echo is in development and probably be here at some stage in pen, and they're all made by different companies. They've all got you know, different features, but that's something that will be sort of more available in the next few years. Um, next thing is, this is the sort of marketed type two pump, it's called the Vigo, um, which is distributed in Australia by AMSL. Um, so it's a once daily disposable, what's called patch pump. So as opposed to the traditional pump that is used in type one diabetes, where you have a little needle that sits under the skin and then a tube that connects to a permanent pump that you keep for all time or until the warranty runs out. Um, this is a disposable pump that you um, place on your tummy once a day and it holds a variable amount of insulin depending which model you have. So um, it delivers both your basal and your bolus insulin. So it will deliver your long acting insulin over the course of 24 hours and then you press a little button on the side and you click it to, do, to deliver your mealtime insulin in two unit increments. Um, and that basically means you don't have to use insulin pens. Um, depending on what, which insulins you're using. So you fill it with rapid-acting insulin, so your Nova Rapid or equivalent, um, and it gives you a drip feed of that insulin over 24 hours plus whatever you click for your meals. So that's called the Vigo, and it is marketed for type 2 diabetes in Australia. Um, it doesn't have uh, CGMS or monitoring that goes along with it, um, but it's certainly an option that is available here now. Something that's not available yet, but probably will be in the not too distant future, is one called the Secure Sim Simplicity uh, Patch Pump. So this one's worn for three days. Um, it delivers, uh, it holds 200 units of insulin and rapid acting again. Now this one doesn't give you your drip feed basal insulin, it just gives you your mealtime boluses. And similarly, you click the two buttons on each side and you have to press both so you can't accidentally knock it knock it and give yourself insulin without meaning to. So that's its main safety program. Um, and again, if every time you click those two buttons down, it gives you two units of insulin. So this is not yet available in Australia. It is FDA approved in the US um, and will be rolled out in pharmacies in the next six months from what I'm told. So it'll be something you can actually get from your chemist in the US as opposed to needing to contact a company to, go, to book a pump, for example. Um, they're also develop this same company is also developing a similar three-day patch pump that will deliver both basal and bolus insulin, so it would cover both your Lantus and your Nova Rapid or um, equivalent, whether you'd, um, whichever insulin you're using. Anyone on one of these the patch pumps? No? Yeah, they're relatively new, um, and they certainly wouldn't suit everyone, but if, for example, you don't like using insulin pens, then it's an option. Um, I've put this website up because I think it's a, a really good, it has some really good user stories and um, guides on how to select what type of technology is right for you. So it's called diabeteswise.org. Um, and it has a whole lot of user experiences, mainly on type 1 diabetes, but some on type 2 as well, um, of people who have used uh, pens and meters, pumps and meters, sensors and pens, every combination of all the technologies that you can imagine and the various pros and cons. And they, what I like is that they have this uh, questionnaire at the start on the home page that says, is your current diabetes technology working for you? And you can fill out this questionnaire and sort of see if there are other options that might be a better fit. So it's just something to think about or to have a, a Google in a spare moment of leisure. So these are the new glucagon formulations that I um, briefly mentioned, and I think this is important because this is likely to come to Australia in the not too distant future. Who has a glucagon pen at home? No one? You, you do? Yeah. So basically, I think anyone who's on insulin, um, certainly if, they're, if you're on mealtime and basal insulin, should probably have a access to a glucagon pen. A glucagon pen is what's used to treat severe hypoglycemia, so really low blood sugar. So not the sort of low blood sugar where you feel a bit funny, a bit sweaty, a bit clammy, and you have some jelly beans. We're talking unconscious hypoglycemia. So, um, and in the setting of your family being around, 
Um, if they found you unconscious on the floor, they couldn't rouse you, this is what you would be injected with to get your glucose to come up quickly and restore you to consciousness. So if anyone's ever had a really bad hypo and the ambulance has been called, this is what they would give you. They would give you an injection of glucagon and then you get the jelly beans and the biscuits, etc. So at the moment, the glucagon we have available in Australia comes in a little orange kit and it actually requires you to mix the powder and make it up, which is not the easiest thing in the world. And you can imagine if you've got a loved one or family member lying unconscious on the floor, the last thing you're wanting to do is desperately trying to read the instructions and go, oh God, I don't know how to use this, and then just injecting them. And I've, I know a lot of people who eventually don't use their glucagon because they haven't been able to use it in the heat of the moment. And we do educate people on how to use it, um, and you can get educated on this from your diabetes educator. But even at the best of times, if you're panicking and you're worried about your husband or your wife, sometimes that just all goes out the window, as you can imagine. So these new glucagon formulations, which are the first new ones available in a long, long time, take that step out. So they're already mixed. So one of them is actually a nasal glucagon that you get them to sniff up the nose, like a spray. Um, and the other one is a bit like an EpiPen. So Everyone familiar with an EpiPen for really bad allergies? So you basically just get the pen and ram it against the leg, no thinking involved. Um, so that's what they developed and is available in the US now. So you don't have to do any mixing or drawing up, you just stick it on the leg and it gives it as an intramuscular injection immediately. So you can imagine that that's gonna be you know, a big change and much more accessible for people. So I think this is really good. Um, and this is all, they've both been approved in the US just this year. So hopefully Australia in the next year or so. We're always the last to get things, but eventually. Um, in terms of what I think will happen in 2020 and beyond, I think hopefully, my hope is that we'll have subsidised access to the flash glucose monitoring, which is that swipey Libre that I showed. Um, there's also research looking at completely non-invasive glucose monitoring, so not even having that disc on your arm. We're talking using lasers and just like swiping your fingernail. Um, and that is in development in sort of animal models. There's also nanotechnology in terms of releasing ins insulin molecules out that way, and who knows what else. So the only limit is our imagination, I think. Now, this is... Uh, in terms of the topic of my talk, which was new additions to diabetes management and the theme of this year being family, this is my little girl. This was my addition to our family earlier this year. So when I was writing this talk, I sort of thought to myself, what will diabetes look like when she's my age? And my hope is that if we don't have a cure, which we might, then at least all the technologies and things that I've talked about will be not only accessible, but even better by then. So that's my hope for the future and for people's families. Um, and I just had a few final thoughts. I think technology is a space in diabetes that is exploding. It's very hard for everyone to keep up. And I think you have to find out of the huge amount that's available to you, what suits you in your particular, particular scenario. So just because your best mate likes X doesn't mean you have to use that. Find what works for you. I think as endocrinologists and specialists, we have a responsibility to keep up to date with it um, because if we don't know about it, then who can you ask? Um, and I think getting equitable access and funding through the government is something that we really have to be striving for. Um, they estimate that digital diabetes care by 2025 will be worth more than $12 billion. So there is huge financial incentive for these companies continue to continue rolling out more options. So I think we're only gonna see more and more of this stuff, which is exciting. And I think I will leave it there and I've finished under time, so. <laughs>